It is just one of the greatest rushes of all time. Jets don't like to go slow. When you look at this airplane, all you see is speed. Oops. That was a little fast. At extreme speeds, you're going to be injured. Go to your local football team and wait for the defense to tackle you. That's what it feels like. We're not really going up there for surprise. If something did go wrong, you've got very little time to actually do much about it. The aircraft literally disintegrated around us. You've just opened a whole nother can of worms. We're talking tornado strength air. Normally, if you're going that fast and you eject, you're, you're going to have a bad day. I said a solemn prayer, and I jumped off the side. Maybe I won't get home for dinner tonight. If there isn't a good chance you'll get killed, it isn't worth doing in the first place. Only a handful of people know how it feels to travel faster than sound. It's hardly an easy ride. Get ready for the ultimate speed high. If that don't turn you on, you don't have a switch. Where can you catch the fastest ride on Earth? Military pilots from all over the world come to this little airfield in South Africa called Thunder City to train on supersonic jets. But most of its customers are civilians. Stuart Rose, a 54-year-old British businessman, is about to shell out $10,000 for the mother of all joyrides. I think somebody said to me, why am I doing this? Somebody once said to me that flying is the best fun you can have with your pants on. So how does that for an answer? Rose's ride, a British fighter that flies at more than twice the speed of sound, the lightning. Rose's pilot, Dave Stock, a veteran of the South African Air Force. There's just no comparison to the lightning today, tomorrow, or beyond. It's like sitting on the front of a missile. Uh, I'm a bit apprehensive, I won't deny it. I mean, this is a serious plane, and this is a serious uh, experiment for me. This airplane will bite you. At low speed, it'll bite you hard. You gotta be really careful with what you do. If you break your concentration for seconds, the inertia will catch you and you just won't, won't be able to clear the ground. You know, there's an old saying, uh, there, are, there are old pilots and bold pilots, but no old bold pilots. Okay, we're just speeding up the engines. Now we're good to go. Rose is three minutes from the supersonic edge. Breaking the sound barrier changed more than just flight. It revolutionized design. Building a faster aeroplane is not enough. Its design has to protect from the fallout of supersonic flight. A 747 cruises at Mark 0.85, just under the speed of sound. Air flows into the engine and fuel ignites. Interrupting the airflow can result in disaster. An F-18 flies twice as fast. At this speed, a jet makes waves, shock waves cross the sound barrier and the shock waves become hazardous. 
the legendary blackbird flies at over three times the speed of sound. More than 3,500 kilometers an hour. So fast, the shockwave flattens against the aircraft and enters the engines. But if the wave is disturbed, it'll snuff them out like a candle. The design solution? A shockwave diffuser. It slows the air and directs it cleanly into the engine, making for safe, smooth sailing. The Blackbird no longer flies, yet this spy plane remains the world's fastest aircraft. It flew at more than three times the speed of sound. That's over 60 kilometers every minute. It flew at world record altitudes of over 26,000 meters. So high, pilots had to wear the same spacesuits as astronauts. When you were flying it, you knew at that time you were flying higher and faster than anyone else in the world. That was a pretty good feeling. Most pilots like to fly the latest, fastest, and best. And that's what this represents. This is the ultimate in performance and has been for 40 plus years, still is. And it helped us win the Cold War, I might add. Bob Gilliland is the most experienced supersonic test pilot alive. And he was the first pilot to fly the top secret Blackbird. very secret. You couldn't even tell your wife where you're going, when you're returning, uh, anything about anything. And that's the only way you can keep a secret, really. The secret of its performance? An ingenious design that withstands the impact of supersonic flight. The stress of supersonic flight shows even when the aircraft is on the ground. The airplane's constant expansion and contraction causes fuel leaks. At supersonic speed, friction heats the titanium fuselage up to 350 degrees Celsius. The aeroplane lengthens by up to 12 centimeters. At this speed, most paints would melt. But the SR-71 has a special paint that not only withstands supersonic speed, it deflects radar. It's what makes the Blackbird black. In all, 32 Blackbirds were built. 12 were lost to accidents, tested beyond the limits of what is possible. What aviators call pushing the envelope. We had emergencies all the time in the beginning. <laughs> you can't rack up a lot of flying time doing that. If it isn't a good chance you'll get killed, it isn't worth doing in the first place. Pushing the envelope means rough treatment for the planes and life-threatening situations for the pilots. Seeing a supersonic flight up close is next to impossible. To reach extreme speeds, it's fly high or die. Going supersonic at very low altitudes, you'd be seriously hurting people, possibly killing them. I've seen uh, the effect of the supersonic shockwave of a phantom flying supersonic at 100 feet altitude. Yeah, the trees that flew over, they were horizontal, not vertical anymore. We're talking tornado strength air. Tornado is a pretty accurate description of what Plunia flies. The new Eurofighter, nicknamed the Typhoon. We've been doing quite a lot of air combat maneuvering lately, going up and fighting each other. It's, uh, it's like the sport of kings, really. And we're always always going to whip their asses with an airplane like this.
Because you can just point it straight at the skies and it will just keep on going and it will go until you run out of fuel. The Typhoon flies at more than twice the speed of sound and its capability sometimes takes pilots by surprise. Because it accelerates so well that sometimes we've had guys go on supersonic unintentionally. We're like, oops, that was a little fast. You don't feel it, you don't hear it. Where it can be heard is far below. The sound of the speed of sound. The mighty sonic boom was first heard six decades ago. The shock heard around the world. 1945. The Soviets rolled into Eastern Europe. World War II had ended and the Cold War began. The Americans and Soviets raced to fly ever higher and faster. Veteran pilots were already taking extreme risks, while in steep dives, their planes would violently shudder. They didn't know it, but they were knocking on the door of the sound barrier. Mark 1, 1,225 kilometers per hour. To those test pilots, it was the final frontier. Like Everest, Atlantis and El Dorado. Unknown, unexplored, unconquerable. Many believed that no flyer could cross that barrier and come back alive. But a brave few vowed to break through or die trying. The experimental aircraft was shaped like the only object then known to travel at supersonic speeds. A 50 caliber bullet. The pilot, a 25-year-old Air Force captain named Chuck Yeager. Over the course of 12 teeth-rattling flights, Yeager took the Bell X-1 to the edge of the sound barrier. Then, on October the 14th, 1947, on his 13th flight, Jaeger hit Mark 1.06 and traveled faster than sound. Supersonic flight is a two-edged sword. With speed comes danger. If something did go wrong at uh, those sort of speeds, you've got very little time to actually do much about it. The Eurofighter has just entered service. To get up to speed and rehearse for disaster, all Typhoon pilots train on a simulator. The first thing you do is get away from the ground. Obviously the ground's got a pretty high probability of killing you if you get anywhere near it. But in most jets, and this aircraft certainly on the flight control system's got quadruplex redundancy, so you've got four flight control computers in there. So there's plenty of things that really have to go catastrophically wrong before the aircraft's going to fall out of the sky. The airplane's computers will prevent the pilot from hurting the airplane, but that doesn't mean the pilot can hurt himself with the airplane. The feeling on takeoff, just to feel that power. If anybody wants to try that one out, go to your local uh, football team and wait for the defense to tackle you. That's what it feels like. A sudden change in speed or direction magnifies the force of gravity. Pilots call it pulling G's. The way G's work is at two G's, your body feels like it weighs twice as much as it already does. At seven and a half G's, that's seven and a half times what your body weighs. The only real comparison is go on a carnival ride, one of the loop-de-loops. I think they range from three and a half to five and a half Gs by now. Take that times two and you know what this feels. And it's not just for two or three seconds like on those rides. This may go up to 
60 seconds even more if we had to. And sometimes they do have to. G-forces are at their most extreme during tight turns. Gravity forces blood towards the legs, away from the brain. Less blood means less oxygen. Tunnel vision sets in. Color fades. And then, blackout. The average person will pass out at two sustained G's. Fighter pilots are trained to take nine G's. But pull too many G's for too long, and even the best pilots black out. Pilots call it G-lock. G-lock stands for G-induced loss of consciousness. And that is incredibly dangerous, especially at lower altitudes, because it takes sometimes several minutes for these pilots to regain consciousness. The blood wants to be in your boots. We want to force the blood back up to your heart so it gets back to your head. That's the most critical thing. The less blood you have going to your head, the higher the likelihood that you're going to G-lock. I like to say the ideal jet pilot is somebody that's about five foot tall, no neck, and has a slightly elevated blood pressure. The longer the distance is from your eyes to your heart, the more work you're going to have to perform to get that blood back up into your head. Most pilots who fly supersonic aircraft wear a G-suit, a tight garment that squeezes the legs and abdomen to keep blood in the upper body. Though the G-suit helps, they still need to know their limits. If they're trained well, they'll realize some of the warning signs and then they're able to ease off on the G before they get to the point where they lose consciousness. Sometimes you can skip those warning signs if the G onset rate is fast enough and you can go from being awake to being asleep in just a few milliseconds. The aircraft uh, environment can be very unforgiving. Even if pilots don't lose consciousness, the training can still leave its mark. During a high G maneuver, centrifugal force flings blood against the walls of blood vessels until the capillaries burst. Aviators call it G measles, an initiation into the exclusive club of supersonic piloting. One thing I don't think a lot of people realize is just how hard of work it is to fly a high-performance airplane. If it was really a tough fight, long sustained, high G loads, it's probably uh, the small muscles that you get as if you've done a good two to two and a half hour heavyweight workout. And that's all over the body. You feel tired, beat up, and just generally drained. We treat these, especially our jet aviators, like elite athletes. We want them to be on top of their game every time they strap that jet on. But it's not just elite military pilots who get to experience life with supersonic speeds. Back in South Africa, civilian Stuart Rose is getting ready to smash into the sound barrier. That works really nicely. The afterburners are coming on. At 350 knots. And we're aboard. We're going to accelerate. We'll go straight up into the vertical. And then we're straight up. And we reached 15,000 feet in about eight seconds. Oh, fantastic. And that's what I call power. The lightning climbs at 250 meters a second, from runway to 15,000 meters in one minute. There are not many airplanes you can go vertical straight after takeoff, and there's one of the few that can do. The lightning is just a, is the rocket ship. Um, it's like 
driving a Formula One car. Mike Beachyhead should know. He drives fast cars, fast motorcycles, fast boats, and fast aeroplanes. <laughs> He owns 11 supersonic jets, the world's largest and fastest private air force. As a child, he built model airplanes in his bedroom. It didn't even occur to me that one day I'd actually be flying one of these things. It was almost, that was just a you know, dream too far, it was too unrealistic. The boy who built models grew up to make a fortune building custom yachts. He traded in his toy aeroplanes for the real thing. But these are no ordinary aircraft. First, a surplus British fighter called a Hawker Hunter. Bought over the phone during a Sotheby's auction. It flies at just over the speed of sound. But not fast enough for Mike. Then he bought a supersonic nuclear bomber called a Buccaneer. Still too slow. So he bought a Lightning. Then three more. There's a lovely quote from a Lightning pilot after his first solo. The guy says, how do, how do you manage to keep up with the airplane until I left the brakes off? <laughs> and all hell breaks lit. Of all the world's antiques, these are among the rarest. Just three buccaneers are still flying. Mike owns all of them. Only four lightning still take to the skies. He has all four, and anyone can fly them. For a price. Funny enough, most of the people who come to fly here are not pilots. They're just guys who really just want to experience the rush, who love the machines. They just have this great love of, you know, raw power and noise and, uh, you know, <laughs> that's what it's about. Well, we, uh, we're turning right on course for the military flying area. Um, and uh, if you put your hand and feet on, uh, you can take control. Well, oh, thanks very much. Okay, how does she feel? Feels absolutely fantastic. So light on the touch, that's quite amazing. Crossing 21,000 feet now, we cleared up to 29. So you have to wait till you're offshore before you break the sound barrier, do you? Yeah. If you look out just to your right hand side, we need to look at the, the coastline, head to the coast. Once we cross the coast, we can go supersonic. So I expect this thing breaks fuel, does it? It sucks, guys. We've just we've just about come up for end of transfer of the uh, the ventral tank. The cookers in the back, they'll be blowing about 500 liters a minute out the back end. That's like going out in six seconds. It's like the forbidden fruit. It's such fun to fly, and you get so carried away with it. You must discipline yourself to look at the field because if it goes quiet on you, it you know, glides like a manhole cover and it's not going to be much fun. <laughs> Everyone expects to hit this wall as they go through Mahuan, you know, this huge sound barrier. In this airplane, you get a cobblestone ride around about Mach 0.95 to 98. You feel that cobblestone effect? It feels like we're on a on a horse and carriage on a Colston Road. It's the transonic effects coming up from Mach 1 shortly. It's like a bit of slight, uh, a slight buffet. Yep, that's the Colston effect. If we slow down, it will disappear. If we speed up, it will disappear. But once you go through that and you get actually get supersonic, it's absolutely smooth and very, very quiet, which is sort of disconcerting for anyone who's been expecting this huge bang as they go through the sound barrier. We're crossing the coastline. We could just ease the nose over and uh, we're going to go supersonic. Fantastic. At almost 14,000 meters up, a young boy's dream comes true. 
Mark 1.3. And we need to be up there to go supersonic, otherwise we break windows and make people grumpy. Faster than a, a speeding bullet, but slower than a pink elephant. <laughs> I wasn't sure how I would feel, but actually it's absolutely great. It feels very comfortable. It's remarkably quiet. I thought it'd be much noisier. Then we descended down to low level on the sea. Yeah, you're doing 500 knots at 50 feet off the deck. Well, there's not much room for error. But it's, it's one of the greatest feelings because you, it's amazing the moment you climb to even three, four, five hundred feet, the speed sensation goes away. So low is exponentially more dangerous, but it gives you an incredible rush. That's it. You look at the gas now, just about gone. So it's time to go and land. With such small wings, the Lightning has less lift at slow speeds, so it has to land quickly, almost as fast as a Formula One car. There we go, touchdown, drag shoot. And that's the Lightning. Very amazing. Damn, I haven't had so much fun for a long time. Thank you so much. You know, any idiot pilot can jump into one of these things and make someone ill or feel very uncomfortable in a heartbeat. That's not the point. The point is to make a person really enjoy it and love it and remember it forever. Scared of whatever. It was fantastic. He's uh, gave me a great ride. Fantastic. I'm coming back next. I'm, it's good enough. I'm coming back next year. It's like climbing Everest. Why do you climb Everest? Because it's there. Uh, why do you go supersonic? Because it's there, it's the sound barrier, and there are so few people who've been supersonic. It's like going to space. It is just one of the greatest rushes of all time, you know, when you spool the engines up and then you light the afterburner, and then it's just you know, great fun. Dogs bark, babies cry, noise, and you just turn your ears back and off you go. Supersonic flight is one of the world's ultimate speed highs. But push things too far, and even the most advanced aircraft may not be able to pull back from the edge. If you're serious about supersonic flight, then this must surely be the place to visit. The Naval Air Station at Patuxent River, Maryland or PAX, home to the U.S. Navy's elite test pilot school. John Glenn, Neil Armstrong, and nearly a hundred other astronauts all graduated from PAX. Pilots from the U.S. Army, Navy, and Marines come here to be tested to their limits. U.S. Marine Major Matt Kelly is an FA-18 test pilot. When you're getting ready to apply full power at the end of the runway, you kick the afterburners in, and it just feels like somebody kicked the back of your chair. When you've seen speeds that you're flying that you've never seen before, if that don't turn you on, you don't have a switch. Kelly's job involves much more than extreme flight speeds. His test flights also focus on making airplanes do things they shouldn't. High-speed flight can be dangerous, but low-speed flight can be just as dangerous, especially for a fighter aircraft, which is designed for higher airspeeds. If the aircraft is flying too slowly, it can go into what pilots call a stall spin. Only the best pilots can regain control. Even more dangerous is the flat spin, which looks as if a giant hand has thrown the aeroplane like a frisbee. No longer aerodynamic, a jet in a flat spin is $37 million of dead weight. It's one mistake no pilot should make. 
Today, Major Kelly will deliberately lose control of his supersonic FA-18. In a test like this, the pilot's worst enemy is his own ego. Because no one wants to eject in an airplane, and it's something that is relatively uncommon, the pilot has a tendency to feel like he can always pull it out. A lot of guys have paid the ultimate price for holding on just a second or two seconds, three seconds too long because they think they can actually keep the airplane flying. One protection for Kelly is a fail-safe altitude. We pass 6,000 6, feet and the airplane's not recovering, we'll have to eject at that point. Matt Kelly flies in the slipstream of giants, the first supersonic test pilots. The men who pioneered the car and the submarine are long dead. But supersonic flight is still so new that it's possible to talk to its pioneers, at least the ones who lived through the test flights. Scott Crossfield was the first man to fly at twice the speed of sound, and then three times the speed of sound. He helped design and fly the legendary X-15 rocket plane, and it nearly killed him. Well, that airplane and I had a Mexican standoff. I was going to break that bronc, and it was going to kill me. <laughs> I had an airborne explosion, two airborne fires. I broke it in two on a landing, and it blew up on the ground on me once. But I won. There are occasions when I thought maybe I won't get home for dinner tonight. One such day was June the 8th, 1960. As Crossfield tested a supersonic engine on the tarmac, the airplane exploded. It's just like being in the sun, orange all around me, very bright. Then it got dark, and moving in that dark spot was an Air Force fire truck with just a wall of water in front of it. I was pretty well protected by that steel airplane. And really the hero of that was one of my mechanics that came into that fire to rescue me. We made a lot of mistakes, but we never let anybody know it. We got away with it. We didn't kill very many people. Every day we would do something, go somewhere that we'd never been before. I won't we knew what we were doing. A lot of people said you couldn't fly faster than the speed of sound. And uh, they, ate, they ate a lot of crow after we did. Any test pilot that says he was never afraid should never be a test pilot. Eventually, if you go fast enough and low enough, parts of your aircraft are going to rip off. And it's just a question of at what airspeed um, that'll happen to any aircraft. So one of the most critical types of flight testing we do at PAX is the flutter test points. Because you have to find out how fast and low the aircraft can go before you can do other stuff. From the 33,000, less than a mile to the first maneuver, engage. We didn't hit any limits, so we're going to proceed to event two. What pilots fear most is loss of control. All military aircraft are tested in spins to see how they will recover. If the guys coming in on target and he's trying to obviously avoid being shot at, he might have to do some pretty aggressive maneuvers. So you have to test the worst case scenario. The spin test is a critical test obviously because there's a chance the aircraft might not recover. Squirt, that was a bit unusual. Didn't expect that one. Each aircraft has its own unique safety limits. The hard part is finding them. 
anything beyond that is within a safety margin that you've said you don't want to pass. So you try not to test the aircraft till failure, basically, is what would happen if you kept going. Yeah, we did go inverted. We'll proceed. Yeah, that should be a sure stop. In the past three decades of testing, Pax River has lost two airplanes. They have never lost a single pilot. But previous test pilots weren't so lucky. On January the 25th, 1966, test pilots Bill Weaver and Jim Zweyer took a Blackbird to three times the speed of sound. At about 24,000 meters up, the right engine died. The dead engine became an anchor, and the good engine kept exerting so much force, it ripped the plane apart in mid-air. Zweyer ejected. But before Weaver could eject, he blacked out. The plane broke up around him. I remember thinking to myself, boy, I just had a terrible dream. I hope I wake up pretty soon. That was awful. Thought to myself, God, that wasn't a dream. That really happened. And if that really happened, I must be dead. I thought to myself, gee, being dead isn't so bad. What's everybody worried about? And then I became fully aware, fully conscious, and realized that I wasn't dead, and I had somehow become separated from the airplane, and I was still alive. The aircraft literally disintegrated around us, and yet I was literally in good shape. I had a few minor bruises. I looked around, and I could see another parachute. First thing I saw, and it was Jim's parachute, and I was so greatly relieved. Weaver came down on a ranch in New Mexico. Here's this guy coming toward me with a cowboy hat. He said, well, I saw your buddy come down. I'm going to go over and see, see if I can help him. Came back about 10 minutes later with the devastating news that Jim was dead. He had not made it. Jim Zweyer's death confirmed the ultimate risk of supersonic flight. Ejection at supersonic speeds. If for some reason you find it necessary to leave the creature comforts, if you will, of the cockpit, and now you've pulled that ejection handle, you've just opened a whole nother can of worms. Lieutenant Commander Matt Hebert trains pilots for one of the most dangerous maneuvers of supersonic flight, ejection. The decision to eject has to be second nature. Because the aircraft is traveling at such a high rate of speed in most cases, there are split seconds, literally, that are survival or not survival. Essential in this vital maneuver, keeping still, head up, back straight, limbs in. If you're out of the proper body position for this ejection seat, you're likely to end up with some cervical or some neck injuries as, as you pull that handle. One danger is spinal compression. The force is so strong that pilots have ended up a few centimeters shorter after ejecting. The trainer exerts only two G's on the body, one-tenth of the force of a real ejection. A pilot may experience 20 plus G's as he goes up the rails, but it's only for a second, second and a half. The ejection sequence happens that fast. The problems don't go away when their decision to eject kicks in. The next thing that he'll face is a wind blast once he gets out into the airstream. At supersonic speeds, 
Hitting a blast of wind can be like hitting a concrete wall. At extreme speeds, and that would exceed right around five, six hundred knots, you're going to be injured. Some, some type of bodily injury. The engineers at Patuxent River know just what kind of injury a pilot could endure. If you can imagine yourself sticking your hands and face outside of your car window going about 600 miles an hour, that's kind of what we test here. The engineers can simulate winds of over 1,000 kilometers an hour and test the effects on both the dummy and the equipment. If that stuff catches the wind stream, uh, what could happen is the force of that can cause the helmet to come off, put a lot of strain on the neck and, and cause the neck to break. We develop a new radio, a new survival vest, a new uh, life preserver, a new helmet. We verify that it's not going to cause any problems during the ejection. Today, they're testing a new helmet. These mannequins are designed to withstand these types of tests over and over. The humans not, but our instrumentation that we mount inside these mannequins can tell us what forces, what accelerations the human is seeing. The test is captured on high-speed cameras that operate at a thousand frames a second. All right, Haley, go ahead and bring up pressure. Now, the instant replay. We rigged the test so that the head is in a downward position when we start. And you can see the head gets slammed into the head pad. But where it gets worse is when this head gets twisted, turned down. That is something that we don't like to see when we do these types of tests. In a real ejection, the pilot would have broken his neck. But that's why we do these tests. Better do it on the mannequin than see this in real life. But in earlier tests into supersonic survival, the test dummies weren't always mannequins. The escape systems that we have today are as a result of the work that we did 45 years ago. Colonel Joe Kittinger belongs to the elite band of pilots who have survived ejection in combat. Shot down over Vietnam, he was a prisoner of war for 11 months. He holds a distinction all his own. He is the only man to have traveled at the speed of sound without an aeroplane. On August the 16th, 1960, Kittinger prepared for a high altitude bailout from over 30 kilometers up. I went through the checklist. Uh, I said a solemn prayer, and I jumped off the side. I ended up rolling over my back and looking up at the balloon, which was stationary. But to me, it looked like it was doing a thousand miles an hour, rocketing into space. But actually, I was going down at a fantastic speed. At about 90,000 feet, uh, I went supersonic. I went 714 miles an hour, but I was only there just briefly. As the density of the air increased, I constantly slowed down. And I free fell for four minutes and 36 seconds before the main parachute opened. Kittinger landed with hardly a scratch. His heroic jump remains a record to this day. He proved a body can go supersonic and live. Kittinger himself followed in the footsteps of another high-speed pioneer. Dr. Stapp was a, the bravest man I ever met in my life. And I knew a lot of fighter pilots, a lot of test pilots, but I never met a man with the courage that he had. A doctor in the U.S. Air Force, Colonel John Stapp volunteered himself as test dummy to test the effects of G-forces during a crash. 
the same kind of forces that smash into the body during high-speed ejection. He strapped himself onto a rocket-powered sled, mounted on a 600-meter-long track equipped with 45 sets of brakes, one of the most powerful braking systems ever built. Uh, I was right alongside of him when he went down that sled, and that was a remarkable shot. On the most extreme test run, Stapp went from 1,017 kilometers an hour to zero in 1.4 seconds, a land speed record that stood for decades. As he came to a stop, he was subjected to 42 times the force of gravity. It's like ejecting at 12,000 meters at more than one and a half times the speed of sound, or driving into a brick wall at 200 kilometers an hour, except you feel it for 10 times as long. The bravest man I ever met, uh, because he knew physiologically what was gonna happen to him on that tremendous deceleration. Stapp's eyes jumped out of their sockets. He broke his wrists, he shattered ribs, yet all of his injuries healed. John Stapp died at 89, of old age. But even the most authentic simulation can't completely prepare pilots for reality. At these speeds, any maneuver can quickly become a dangerous mishap. Recoveries are rare. In a pilot's worst nightmare, he's out of control and heading towards the ground. There's only one option. The pilot sits on a pyrotechnic catapult. He ejects with a 20G blast. In less than two seconds, he's heading towards safety. Supersonic ejection is so dangerous, only a handful of pilots have done it and lived to tell the tale. Their survival is more than a spectacular story. It's a miracle. This plant builds what every military aviator hopes he'll never have to use. Ejection seats. Air Force pilot Brian Udell had to use his while traveling at supersonic speeds. The speed at which Dennis and I went out, neither one of us uh, should have lived. The seats had never even been tested at that speed. April the 18th, 1995. During a night training mission off the coast of North Carolina, Udell began a routine turn. About 110, 100 degrees through the turn or so is when things went from good to not good. My first indication that, that we even had a problem was I started hearing wind rushing over the canopy. I started flying at a very young age. My father uh, is who taught me, and he, uh, he said, always trust your instruments, but always listen to the airplane because it will talk to you. And this airplane was definitely talking. But in the pitch black sky, his airplane was telling him two stories. His main display showed him at 7,300 meters, making a right-hand turn. But a backup instrument showed him at just over 5,000 meters and heading straight for the ground. His speed was over 300 meters per second. 17,000 feet to 10,000 feet went by in just over five seconds. I always briefed and used 10,000 feet as an out-of-control ejection altitude. That was at the that was the, the the point in space that if I don't have control of this airplane, it's time to get out. I got in a body position, commanded the bailout, and pulled the handles. Basically, bailout, 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 go. In that time frame, 
4,000 feet went by. The canopy blew off at 4,500 feet. Dennis went out at 3,000 feet. I left the cockpit at 1,500 feet, got my parachute about 500 feet above the water. Had I waited even a half a second longer to pull the ejection handles through the sequence of events, I would have hit the water still in my seat. The wind killed his passenger, Dennis White, instantly. The uh, wind blast uh, at 800 miles an hour, which is about the speed at which we went out, uh, stops becoming wind and basically starts becoming a freight train. It immediately ripped my helmet and mask right off my head. It broke all the blood vessels in my head and face. My head was literally swollen the size of a basketball. Lips were the size of cucumbers. So there's metal bayonets that clip into the helmet. Both of those gouged right up my face. Took nice uh, chunks of skin right out. My left arm blew out and into the wind stream. And when it did, it dislocated my elbow blew my arm backwards and it tore the muscle across my chest. There's retaining bars down here on either side of the seat. They're supposed to keep your legs within the confines of the seat. Well, at this speed, it took those bars and bent them straight out. Now my leg goes out into the wind stream and starts whipping. The only thing holding my right leg on at the knee joint was the artery, the vein, the nerve, and the skin. That was it. It was pitch black. I could hear the parachute ruffling above me. I could feel the cold night air on my face, and I knew I had to get busy. My life preserver had never been tested at that speed and shredded, looked like rags hanging around my neck. Now I'm getting concerned. I'm going into the ocean, and I'm hoping my life raft doesn't look like my life preserver. It didn't. After drifting and shivering for four hours, gravely injured, Udell was rescued by the Coast Guard. I owe my life to the people that, that, uh, that make this seat. He was told he might never walk normally again, let alone fly. Ten months after his bailout, he was back flying F-15s. Supersonic flight must truly be the ultimate high. Because even pilots who have flirted with disaster still come back for another fix. I have an airplane and I fly a couple hundred hours a year. Airplanes are, are somewhat like young ladies. They, they, they draw your attention. It's still a thrill. But not like the old days when the sound barrier was not yet breached. That thrill is gone. It was the golden era, the golden age. There, there's no X-15s today. There's no exotic flying machine to test today. People today don't have the near as much fun, near as much adventure as we had back in, the, in our heyday. Oh, to be 80 again. But for speed freaks, going supersonic will always be the world's most extreme ride. <laughs>